Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the second session for the day at the Wool Museum. And here we have Eric de Castro Lopo with Fuzz All the Things. <laughs> Well, good morning. Um, thank you, LCA, for having me, and thanks for showing up, um, having to walk all that way for, after Tridge's talk. My name's Eric, as you can see there. I work for Qualcomm. Um, they are paying me this week. They are putting me up in hotels and things, but this is actually work that I've been doing in my own free time. Um, so it's actually not Qualcomm related beyond the part, beyond the part that I'm actually employed by them. And, um, I actually have given previous versions of this talk internally in Qualcomm because there's people there interested in fuzzing. So we're really talking about C and C++ here. I'm sure there's a lot of other people interested, but uh, could I have a show of hands? People who code in C and C++ and or C++. Okay, a good showing of hands. You are in the right place. When I'm coding in C and C++, I often feel that I should be casting these languages into the fiery pits of hell. I know a lot of people don't agree with that. Um, I know that I still code in C and C++. There are a whole bunch of problem domains where it still is the right language in spite of all the difficulty. So for the people who may not be fully aware, I mean, C and C++ languages have an enormous number of ways to do the wrong thing without you really knowing about it, and it will bite you when you least exp well, it'll bite you all the time, but it'll also bite you when you think it's not going to bite you. Um, it's incredibly easy to trigger a number of different coding errors. Those coding errors can end up being potential vulnerabilities, and if your program is taking data from untrusted sources, those vulnerabilities are an attack vector, and suddenly your machine is owned by some botnet on the other side of the planet. Um, we have a long way to go for in that, but that's the topic of another discussion. I came to this particular problem area with two projects. I started LibSoundFile in 90, I released the first version in 98, which is some time ago now, and I became the maintainer of FLAC. So I maintain LibSoundFile to this day. I became the maintainer of FLAC in 2012 or so. No, 2011. Um, the, it, I was all in my little happy place. I'd done a lot of work to make these libraries as safe as possible. And then I got, within about a two week period, I got two bug reports. This was the end of 2014. Two bug reports where they provided these absolutely bizarre files that crashed these two programs, you know, programs for these two. And, um, I asked, how did they do them? And they said, fuzzing. And I said, well, fuzzing. Fuzzing, eh? Um, it's been around since the 1980s. Um, you basically just test your program with random inputs. And random inputs, most of them are just completely rejected outright. There's nothing there. And the thing that happened, in fact, towards the end of 2014, was new fuzzers that provide a quantum leap in effectiveness of finding bugs. And um, like AFL and... So, so I'll, I'll just sidestep here. There's actually, I've found that there's a huge spectrum of how you might be approached by a security um, researcher who's found a bug in your program. So the, the ideal, and I've had the ideal, which is he provided a sample file, he had an address sanitizer, and I'll get to that later, an address sanitizer backtrace with line numbers and you know, files, and um, ask, you know, how long do you think it'll take you to fix it so that I can report this through the proper channels and stuff. And I've actually had the last one as well. You know, here's an exploit script. Um, I'm going to release this in three days. And uh, so it's an exploit script in a language I don't read. Um, I ended up <coughs> spinning up a VM, <laughs> exploit script from somebody on the internet. Yeah, I'm going to run that on my machine. So <laughs> like, I am paranoid, but um, I'm not stupid. So, you know, spin up a VM, generate the file, confirm that it was actually a problematic, and then do enough work to actually get a file that I could actually pull off and be pretty sure wasn't going to exploit my machine that I could then work on correctly the right way. 
Um, so there's this huge, and, and of course, even that's not the worst. The worst is they find the exploit and they sell it to zerodoyexploits.com or whatever. Um, that's the worst. So I mean, it's one thing getting these bug reports. It's put you in this kind of position where you've got to react, and I prefer. So there's some things you have to react to, but there's other things where I like to sort of plan ahead. And my idea was that I need to find out about this stuff because something new has happened with two independent people sending me um, crashes for programs. Um, my motivation was to find all the bugs and fix them before somebody else found them. That's very obvious. It's cut out the middleman and getting a dress sanitizer backtrace is great, but you still want to be able to fix you know, test that you've fixed it, and to do that you need to fix the program and then test it yourself. So it was a matter of learning these techniques that the security researchers are doing and be able to deploy it myself. And finally, as the developer of these programs, I thought that I would actually be, have more, I have, I have domain knowledge about the actual piece of software I'm testing. I know much more about the problem space than the security research, and I should, actually should be able to do a better job. And that is actually a rather interesting little rabbit hole. Um, I, <laughs> you like that? Um, I, I looked at a couple. I found one that I didn't like. Um, it, it, it was really, really complicated to set up and run. I can't remember which, what the name was. But um, I quickly found something called American Fuzzy Lop, which is written by a fellow called Mikhail Zalewski, who I believe is in <coughs> Poland. He works for Google. And I think he's actually doing writing AFL, I mean, it's got Google copyrights and stuff, so I presume he's a Google security researcher and he's writing this for Google. Um, this is one of the ones that is this quantum leap in effectiveness in, in, in this kind of technology. So the, the big picture is actually pretty easy. Um, you compile your target code with um, some scripts, that come, some, they're actually programs, that come with AFL, which are basically wrappers around GCC and, and Clang. So there is both, there's AFL GCC, AFL G++, and the Clang and Clang++ versions of those. And that instruments the binary. And then you provide some example files. And then there's a test runner, which runs your target program against the provided, the, the initial um, template files you've provided and retrieves the instrumentation data and then um, uses a genetic algorithm to generate new versions of the test data based on various kinds of modifications and manipulations of the, of the original uh, files. So it will actually end up, you know, I've, I've run AFL for, on some programs for like a week and a half um, and it's doing 600 to 1,000 executes a second and each one of those is a new file. So it generates a lot of these test inputs. Um, the vast majority of them do absolutely nothing at all. So this all sounds very, very easy. In fact, it's not quite that easy in that AFL is reasonably well documented, but there's a number of little tricks and it's very easy to fool yourself that, you know, the, the, the naive AFL, new AFL user will actually spin it up, run it, find nothing and say, I'm clean. And that ain't the case. It's very, very easy to do it wrong. Um, I had somebody who ran their fuzzer for a week and they actually had the command line wrong so that it was constantly fuzzing standard in and standard in had nothing on it. A week of CPU grunt there, completely wasted. So the other problem is that by default, AFL will only detect a problem if the binary executes in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an unusual manner, so seg faults and, and um, divide by zero and failed assertions. Um, one of the really things, one of the very common things in C and C++ of course is buffer overflow, so you've got a buffer on the, on the, on the stack and you've got an integer after it and you overflow the buffer into the integer. If nothing else goes wrong, AFL doesn't detect that. Sadness, except we have a solution. Um, more work from Google is this. Who's used 
the C and C++ programs, who's used any of the sanitizers? The people who haven't absolutely do it. Um, people might remember when Valgrind was first released, it was the best thing since sliced bread. I think this is the new, this is, this in, comparison, in com combination with fuzzing is significantly better than Valgrind. And Valgrind is awesome. Um, so there's, there's a number of sanitizers. The ones that I commonly see used are MSAN, the, the memory sanitizer. It's, it's not a big gun. It's uninitialized reads and a few other little memory things. It's not that great. I think it was one of the early ones they did. Um, address sanitizer, which is the one that you particularly want to be using with AFL. It is the bee's knees. Um, run continuous integration things with ASAN turned on is fantastic. And then undefined behavior. Um, who's written a C program with undefined behavior? Everyone put your hand up as you have. Yes, well, yeah, it's isomorphic with, yes. Um, the unfortunate thing is that, and I don't understand why, I just know that it doesn't work very well, is that it's not possible to use more than one sanitizer at a time. Some of the things where you might be, some of the things where you might be, um, in, want to try undefined behavior sanitizers, so, so things where you're calculating the length of a buffer that you're about to allocate and you don't want an overflow and you don't want to you know, allocate all of memory. Some of those things will actually end up being um, address sanitizer bugs, something that would be caught by address sanitizer anyway. So I've actually, I've actually gone to the trouble of trying to make a code base undefined behavior sanitizer clean. It's a lot of work. Um, it, Making it undefined behavior sanitizer clean and then running it under the fuzzer didn't find anything new and interesting that address ha sanitizer hadn't already fixed. Um, I, f I found that very interesting. Um, but again, it, it's one more point for address sanitizer. It is insanely great. So this is the dangerous part of the thing where you can repeat this thing. So I've got libsound file here. You simply clone it from GitHub, change it into the directory. You change into the old broken version of libsoundfile before I fixed all the bugs. And um, then you run that script. So if I do that there and I do this here. I prepared this one earlier so you can actually see in the history. I've basically done that. Um, I'll actually run, it's actually a make file, but just to show you what it does. Because it's, so it will, this, this make file will actually build libsoundfile with all of its dependencies, with address sanitizer turned on, with all of the stuff, and then it will simply run that. So we will actually run that. And it normally builds the whole thing, but then getting ready to roll. And this is what it looks like. Um, runtime, and runtime does need to have days there because it's very easy to get to 10 or more. Um, it'll sit, it's sitting there at about 600, um, execs a second, that's just on my laptop running on battery. Um, I'm okay. Sometimes it will hit a thing where it, for some reason I haven't explored that, where it just, it finds one kind of file that makes the whole libsound file file parser run really slow. Um, but we'll come back to that, because that'll be interesting, isn't it? If he's 11. So another Unfortunate aspect of AFL is that it really is only any good at doing file IO. And of course, the big thing about IO is that it can be coming from networks. And we'd really like to be able to fuzz things like networks. People certainly have done it with AFL, but the way they do it is they, so I think people have done it with things like DNS mask, which of course is a very obvious one because the DNS protocol is kind of crafty and there's lots of potentials for a buffer overflows, but people have been doing these things and the idea, what they do is they take the code, hack it to bits, and it's security researchers often, and it's not quite the way I do it, but it, you know, hack it to bits so that they, in the end what they're doing is they're take, taking the file provided by AFL, using it as input into the target code and seeing if it crashes. It, it has been perfectly effective. In fact, there's a researcher called Hanno Bock, who's been doing a lot of fuzzing. And he has actually found the heartbeat, like after the heartbeat blog, he actually found heartbeat using AFL. Um, and there's a blog, blog post for that. So the other one is that we, you can use um, the LLVM libfuzzer, which 
it's a fuzz of doing, it's, it's in the LLVM project. I think it's, it's, in, it's going to be in the 3.8 release, which is coming out very, very soon. I've been running it out of SVN for probably close to a year. Um, and it's an in-memory fuzzer instead of being a file input fuzzer. So you write a test function with that prototype and that name, and you only write the function. It, you then compile it and link it against, um, against the, the lib fuzzer, which actually then produces a main, and it fires away as well. So you know, you, it, simply gives, it, it simply gives you a chunk of memory with a size. And again, you, give it, um, you can give it example input so that you, you're actually fuzzing something close to what your actual target is supposed to accept, uh, rather than just random input, which you can just say, that's not valid, dump it. So we've talked about the things that are easy. Um, unencrypted network protocols like DNS should be relatively easy, to, depending on how the program is structured, but um, it's not that complicated. Software that's designed to be tested and is testable, that is immediately a huge win. Um, difficult is things like complex document types, in particular things like Word documents, um, those kinds of word processor file documents in there. They've got this huge hierarchy, nested hierarchy of components, all with their own little parsers. Those are on the difficult side, and encrypted network protocols in particular are difficult, and we'll come back to that. Peter might, people might remember my friend Peter Miller. Um, Peter passed away 18 months ago, but he had a whole bunch of extremely wise and useful things to say about software engineering. Um, and this is paraphrased. He, he, he said this to me a number of times and a number of different occasions, but it was, this is basically paraphrasing it, that software designed in the presence of automated testing is recognizably different from software developed with testing as an afterthought. The tests have a significant positive influence on the design of the code. And um, people who knew, who knew Peter will confirm that he said things like that on a number of occasions. So maybe a little bit after the Snowden revelations, which I think was the middle of 2013 or 14, um, at the um, Chaos Computer Club Congress in Germany, um, Jacob Applebaum said that there was some suspicion op over the open, the, well, not so much open SSH, but the SSH protocol itself, in that they suspected that no such agency might actually have access to data um, encrypted in this protocol. And of course, this protocol is the backbone of the internet. I mean, there's, take this away and we're in a lot of trouble. Um, so I thought that it would actually be interesting to try and, try and fuzz the actual OpenSSH protocol. And I tried, I, not say I tried, I thought about it a lot. I thought experiments, I looked at the code and went, oh, wow. This is a protocol that is heavily stateful. There's an initial connection, then there's protocol exchange, key exchange, service request, there's asymmetric crypto for the key exchange and symmetric crypto error, there's ephemeral keys that are set up during the things, and there's worse. Each packet coming into the, the thing that actually decodes the packet. It's one large 200 plus line function. It's re-entrant. It's passed in a, a, one of these struct SSH pointers, which has structs within structs within structs that is stateful. Every time it, every time it comes into this function, the state of that, what it's pointing to is different. And then what it does is, if state packet discard returns zero, if it's a bad packet link, disconnect. If it's packet incomplete, return zero and re-enter. Then it does, it, it checks the uh, message of authentication stuff. Bad packet link. In order to fuzz the actual protocol, which is below the and so on, you have to get past all of this first. So you can't simply 
find out where this struct SSH thing has a buffer, and then, because you're never going to get past all this stuff. Um, I did a lot of hacking and a lot of exploration. Um, I think I now know how I might possibly be able to fuzz this thing, but it's 100 hours of work, and I haven't found a spare 100 hours in my life recently. Um, I was hoping to do it over the, over the, the Christmas break, and that never happened. <laughs> um, I think it would, it's, it's still a useful thing. Um, I should just say that you know, I'm not picking on OpenSSH thing. I actually think the, the, the OpenBSD and particularly the OpenSSH teams, in spite of small recent problems, is actually one of the most security aware teams of C programmers on the planet. But they're still writing C, and C is We'll find a way to bite you every single time. Um, how am I going over time there? Where do I finish? Oh, cool. OK. So that might be a nice thing to come and have back and have a look. Oh, look. So up in the top right here, we've got um, cycles done. I've never really fi figured out what a cycle is. Um, I think it's documented somewhere, but it's not a very interesting thing. The thing that is interesting, well, so the, the uh, total paths, uh, that's the number of code paths through the program it's found. Um, for libsound file here, um, I have got it up to 2,600, um, running it for a week and a half with a bunch of different file formats. So there's the thing about libsoundfile is that it handles um, about 20 container types and then a whole bunch of um, audio codec types within the container types. It's not a, it's not a complete um, matrix, but uh, it's a lot of file formats. Um, and you'll see that it's found one unique crash and one unique hang for, after running for nine minutes. Um, that shocked me when I first started doing this. Like it was. Uh, um, people who've, who've done stuff with AL, AFL will tell you that um, you, in the early thing of putting it across a new piece of code, you will be, have a, a, a fix, find a bug, fix it, restart AFL. You'll do that in a loop, in 10 minute loops for, well, depending on the program, but it, it can be for a day or two. Um, and I did for a day or two. Most of them, of course, were these unique hangs. So. Um, Total crashes we will look at at the moment. The, the hangs are things that probably you probably want to fix, and I have fixed in libsoundfile and flack in that they are things like um, going into an infinite loop. Program doesn't terminate, and AFL will kill it with extreme prejudice. Um, so I'm going to stop that, and we'll actually look at what the unique crash looked like. So the, the, the so the 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 program I've been fuzzing is just sound file info, which parses a file and then prints out some information about the file, like number of channels, sample rate, file metadata, all that sort of thing. But we'll have a look at the actual crash file, which it puts, you specify where this is, but there's fuzzing out crashes. And it gives it these crazy um, file names that, that it uses to keep track of how it got to that file. Um, and in fact, that file is actually not a valid Windows file name. <laughs> <laughs> the mailing list told me. <laughs> um, so here we see. Ah, it doesn't quite work. Okay, I'll just. Nah. Yeah. Um, so this is the address sanitizer output, where it says, you know, we've got the worst of the worst. Maybe not the worst, so I'll probably say stack overflow is the worst of the worst. But the second worst of the worst, heap buffer overflow. It is, in fact, a write, which is the, the bad class. Um, tells you an address, and we've got it somewhere. In, it's got file names and line numbers, and um, then some information about how it got there and what's around that in memory. Um, Ah, 
I won't worry about that. But um, this is what makes a dress sanitizer so incredibly useful in and it provides this thing where it's, you've got such a great starting point for actually fixing the problem. And it's, um, you know, it, it'd be... Code that hasn't had this, AFL and address sanitizers together, amazing. Um, so I did also talk about um, libfuzzer. And I do actually have some. OK, so. Oh. I just got to make them. So I just got to build them. So these are. I've, I decided that it would be useful to, to sort of write some little trivial programs that, with obvious bugs to, to just compare AFL with LLVM fuzzer. That was a very obvious one for me. And I've got, so bin, no, not AFL, the fuzzer, buffer, read out of bounds, and bang. Um, and same for the right, but there's some more interesting ones. Um, in fact, I will actually just go to... Here we go. So I've actually got them. That's a good size. Good size, everybody? Okay. So this has a... Actually, that, the, the buffer read... And, this has a very obvious bug in that if it can get past all that if statement, it assigns the pointer to null, and then just a little bit below it, it, re it dereferences that thing and tries to write something, and that should very obviously go bang. And back here, char sequence one, yes, it does go bang incredibly quickly. In fact, LLVM fuzzer took 20,000 odd executions of the program to find something that would actually make it go bang. There's some others like, well, so this, this is one way to write that test where it's something that's very common in sound files is to have a four byte marker that is the marker for a, that starts a chunk of information which might be, you know, the, the next chunk. So f, um, f in, in WAV files, there's F, lowercase f, M, T, space. That marker means that the next thing is the, is the chunk with the sample rate, number of channels, bit width encoding and, and that sort of stuff. So this kind of test is very, very common. But that's a very naive way of writing it. And there's other ways of writing it. And this is one I came back to later. And again, this one goes bang astoundingly quickly. But something like this is actually much, in fact, I actually write it in lib sound file. No, not even like that. It's probably closer to that. And it doesn't find it. It's one of the disturbing things about fuzzing is that it is profoundly easy to write stuff that it simply cannot. I haven't, I haven't had, ever had the patience to let this run more than about a day or so, and it simply does not go anywhere near it. Um, which is really interesting when you think about things like Word documents with these little kinds of markers nested 20 deep into some sort of hierarchy. And it underlines the fact that the fuzzer is actually only as good as the example template files you give it. So if you have a bug that, for, that is in the, the parser for this little part of the file format, and your examples don't have anything with this little part of the file format, it's never going to find it, and you've got the potential for a bug. Well, in fact, you, you, the idea was there that you actually did already have a bug. So there's, there's a number of these things where trivially simple little things like this, and in fact, even that one, it simply does not find it. So I'm kind of curious as to whether that can actually be fixed in AFL. There's been discussion of this issue on the AFL mailing list. 
the idea is that, well, sorry, the response so far has been that um, it's all down to how good a set of template files you can provide for it. I'm not totally happy with that answer. Um, and for licensing reasons, I can't look at AFL too closely. Um, but it's, it's very, very interesting indeed. Um, and again, we come back to the idea that this sort of stuff might be an SSH, and this is how difficult. So this is why we can't just smash a packet in up the top and expect to get past all this stuff, because it's, it's deeply nested conditionals that are simply going to throw the packet away and avoid the potential payload that you may have in your packet. And I think this underlines the fact that, like most testing techniques, it can prove the existence of bugs, but not the absence. Um, formal methods and other more advanced techniques can do much better on this front, but it's still a profoundly useful thing. And finally, I'm actually thinking that this is something that I haven't done yet, but would very much like to, and that is to make fuzzing part of not the, not the tests that the developer is, runs before every check-in, but something that is done on a daily basis or weekly basis where it simply assigns some CPU power, and I've heard of companies that have a lot of CPU power, and then starts to, uh, <laughs> um, and then start to, as part of the development process, have this fuzzing thing. Now, the problem with AFL is that it is actually designed to run indefinitely. It does not halt. It fuzzes, and it keeps on fuzzing. There's no escape mission. And I don't know of there being such a thing in the LLVM fuzzer either. Um, something needs to be done to say, well, OK, on a daily basis with a bunch of hand-picked, hopefully well-chosen test inputs, I'm going to fuzz this for eight hours. And then I'm going to do the same thing tomorrow night or next week. Um, and the other thing is that when I find files that do really bad things, I stick them in a Git repo. It's my personal Git repo. It's, it's not something that I think is something I want to publish, but um, I keep them and I run an address sanitizer compiled version of, of um, AFL uh, sound file info, an address sanitizer compiled version of sound file info over those files every three or four commits. Um, and especially, well, I know the kind of thing, so if, if, I'm figuring, if I'm messing with configure.ac, I don't worry about it. But if I'm actually um, messing with the parsing, or if I'm adding support for new parsing constructs, then I will actually find a template file with that new thing that I'm accepting for those files and fuzz it for a week. Um, for libsound file and flack, that's what I found, is that um, I have not found anything new after a week of CPU doesn't mean it's not there. So I've got some links. Um, Michael Zalewski's um, page for it. There's lots of good documentation. He's got a mailing list that's, that's got a, um, it's a lot of security researchers. Um, it's very interesting reading. Um, people doing things like um, fuzzing C implementations of big num, which is really interesting because as the author of one written in Haskell, I've run Quick Check over it, which is AFL here is working actually in a similar way to, to Haskell's Quick Check library. And then um, the address sanitizer itself, the place to go for that is actually, although it exists in, the address sanitizer exists in both GCC and Clang, uh, most of the documentation seems to be on the LLVM.org website. And um, the fuzzing project is Hanno Bock. He has been fuzzing things very, very seriously for um, a year or more. He actually spoke at FOSDEM about a year ago um, for that. Questions? Paul. Um, the, the thing that occurred to me is um, just before you said it yourself was um, if you've got, if AFL is producing a list of a, you know, a set of files that definitely break your thing, then you just feed them into your next set of tests where you 
Uh, exactly. So I'm, I'm not actually adding them to the test. Well, I'm not actually adding them to the test suite. Um, I I add them to a repo that I check. Uh, sorry, yes. Um, why aren't I adding? Well, sorry. sorry did, did I get to your question, Paul? Well, the question I was going to ask was why why not add them to the public repo? Why just copy the So the question is why not? Um, when, once I find um, a file that blows it up, why don't I add that to the public repo? It's basically because there's time between when I find it and when I actually uh, release a new version. Okay. So that above all, um, it's a bit of shame as well. <laughs> uh, yeah. So up the back. Right. Well, I usually get about ninety four percent coverage in all the cases where I've checked the balance of turning some memory and I get to sort of go back to coverage. But that'll give you full coverage and then you can tell, hey, the fund is tested every two years. Right. That, 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 so that, I'll just repeat that for the, for the the recording was that um gentleman up the back was saying that he actually uh, uses the coverage um features of GCC as well and you can then you can then see that it's uh, um, is see the amount of coverage, and he says he's got up to 94%. Uh, so one of the things I, I that, that triggered was I forgot to mention was that whereas AFL has its own instrumentation, its own custom instrumentation, um, the LLVM fuzzer actually uses Clang's um, coverage feature, coverage in, instrumentation for for the same purpose, which I just I just thought was interesting. So there was another question, Jack. Um, why do you think that you have to get past all of the checks at the start of SSH when ultimately the code is receiving packets through that, um, like, if you want to fuzz the code, then the network packet still has to traverse those things too. Why do you want to get past them? Well, so, for instance, um, if, so one scenario that I've come up with is that you have a Linode VM and someone takes control of that and replaces the SSH daemon with a nefarious one and when you log into that it gives you bad packet. So a specially crafted bad packet which because they've got this custom SSH daemon which does all the right crypto stuff, does all the stuff to get past all of those checks and then somewhere inside that is the payload. That's why you need to get past it. And the reverse is also the case in that, in that uh, you can't always trust. So you know, if you don't actually have sole physical access over the server, you can't trust it. And if you don't, um, the server can't totally trust all the clients. That, that, so, so I mean, that's, that's one of the things that makes the, the open SSH thing such an interesting thing to fuzz, because there's multiple levels in that you want to fuzz the initial negotiation. You want to fuzz all the way through down to, we've actually got a valid authenticated connection. And I mean, there's. There's so much work to do there. You know, Ed. So, so I think the problem with the, the, the open SSH code that you show is more that if you sort of try to simplify it, that entire function is sort of a state machine. And if for every state transition that needs to be performed, it's called. So it gets this struct SSH object, which is its state. But the problem is that the states are not simply numbered or simply labeled. They're determined by a lot of invariants inside of that struct SSH. And I guess that AFL. Well, it's not, they're actually not invariants, they're, they're variants. <laughs> they actually are so, so changing from. Yeah, but, but I mean, that sort of gives AFL a really hard time to sort yeah. of figure out how to get 100% coverage of that function. So yes. That's, yeah, yes. So, so just for the audience offline, um, the, ed there, the, the, the comment there was that um, it's, a, it's a complex state machine and the chances of AFL getting past it are very, very low. So, one more. Paul. Um, thinking of that question of how the, you know, it will go off infinitely, uh, I'm kind of assuming if you think of the search space, it's kind of doing a breadth first search because you don't want yes. to flow through an infinite amount of time and I'm just bit flipping and miss arithmetic yep. lists. Yes. Um, is there any, if you want to sort of do that iterative process where I, you, it spits out a I'll go away and you know, fix the bit in that code that causes that problem. And then you kind of say, well, OK, 
okay, stop AFL, start it with my new code, but resume from where you were in the search space. That, so the, the idea is um, being able to stop and start AFL um, and having it take off, um, start up again from where it, from where it was stopped. Um, there has been talk about this in the mailing list. There is some ability to do that, um, but it's not there yet. Um, as good as it is, it, it, sorry, it, it, it's a big project. It, it, it's a complex piece of software, and it's also marvellous. Oh, here, a question. Right, so the question is, um, is it worth throwing just random files at it? Um, and I know in the case of libsoundfile it actually isn't because it, the way libsoundfile is structured is, is it reads 12 bytes and checks those, the first, the first 12 bytes of the file. And if that doesn't mark, fit one of however many markers there are for the different file formats that uh, libsoundfile accepts, it exits. So, no. However, the Michael Zalewski has actually done a very interesting thing where he actually gave it garbage text and ran it against the JPEG parsing stuff and it generated a valid JPEG file. <laughs> Which is just bizarre. It was not anything, you'd, it wasn't a picture of me or anything, but it was, it, was, it, was, it was just random garbage, but it was a valid JPEG file that, it, you know. <laughs> One more question over here. Exactly. So that's what those, th those, those, ex yes. So, yeah, so, yeah, so the gentleman's suggesting that um, AFL is designed to find its way past those, you know, the valid marker things, and it will if you give it enough time, but there are ways of writing those marker things that, in my experience, it actually can't get past. Yeah. Like when you've got the nested it, it can detect when it's got past one text, two text, three text. Yes. Text. With the mem copy, it's just, it's just running the same path. Yes. And it has no information that it's going into detail. Yep. Um, and it's a matter of how the code is structured. Um, th this is just something I was doing as an experiment to figure out how this tool worked and how I could best utilize it. Um, here we go. One more quick question. Yeah, I was just um, following on from that. Is it possible to see where it's getting up to? So if it's constantly not getting past you know, this meme copy or this sort of thing where you can go look at the code and go, well, maybe I'll rewrite that in a slightly different way so we can get through it. Um, I haven't explored that. Um, it, so the, the question is, is, there, is it possible to look, to look at the internal state of AFL so that um, you can possibly change your code to make it easier for AFL to find the different paths. I haven't looked into that. Um, I will, personally I'm happy to change my code to get rid of compiler warnings and that sort of thing, but th some of those things I'm not too happy to do because you know the way it is written there now is, it, 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 is, it is very much a trade-off and um, yeah, it, it, the, 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 the internal state of AFL is, is not something I've particularly chased up. I'm, I'm, I don't think it's very obvious. I mean, it's a big C program. It's... <laughs> yeah. yeah, C programs all the way down. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your attention.